When it comes to precision reloading, tools and equipment are always an interesting topic. Equipment that allows us to improve the quality of our reloads, as well as allows us to tune our loads faster and monitor the consistency always seem like good investments to me. In today's video, we're going to cover the K&M Arbor Press, as well as the Ellie Wilson Chamber Type Seating Dies. We're also going to use these tools to better understand exactly how neck tension affects the seating force of a projectile. Initially, I intended to cover these products separately, but I think to cover the advantages that this equipment provides us, it just makes sense to go over them together. Today we're going to cover some of the advantages and disadvantages that this equipment provides us and how they might complement your reloading process and see the actual information that we can get from these tools. Now to start off with, I'm not saying that anyone has to buy these. If plinking ammo is your jam, I don't think you're going to see any measurable improvement by using these. If precision in your reloading is your main consideration, I think that these tools are going to provide us some advantages over some of our standard die and press combinations that we may want to consider. When it comes to our die, let's look at all the individual pieces and show exactly how they come together to make a very high quality seating die. This is the entire die disassembled. We'll start off on one end and go to the other. This is the cap, the seating stem, the micrometer, the die body, and the base. There are two versions of the seating stems available, a standard as well as a VLD option. The stem obviously screws into the cap and you can do your rough length adjustment with this. Once you have your appropriate setting, there's a set screw you can use with an Allen key to lock your setting into place. The next part of our assembly process is attaching the micrometer to the die body. The micrometer portion has 50 thousandths of adjustments per revolution. It's marked very well and easily seen to make small adjustments. Once your settings are in place, you have an Allen key to lock in your setting. After these two pieces are reassembled, we can insert our stem in our die body and add it back to the base and our die is assembled. So those are all the basic pieces of our die. Like I mentioned, the VLD stems are available if you would like for an additional cost of somewhere around $20. As far as any other seating stems that are available, I did not see them listed on Ellie Wilson's website. However, there are tons of forums out there that are discussing honing your own. One of the biggest advantages of a die like this is it holding everything in perfect alignment. When the brass is in the die, there's very little slop, if any at all. The area of the die that holds the projectile alignment is so close to projectile diameter. Keep in mind this is for a 264 projectile and the seating stem that's inserted in there only has a thousandth and a half of tolerance. Case and the projectile are held in perfect alignment. Case tolerances hold everything very tight so you're not going to be seeing any slop. In fact, to get your case out, some people recommend tapping on the top and some people even keep a screwdriver handy just to move that projectile out after the seating process is complete. There is a version of this die that does not come with the micrometer top. You can dial in the cartridge overall length with the stem and with its 3824 TPI threads in the cap, one full revolution should change the cartridge overall length by about 42 thousandths. This version has the micrometer feature, and so we can see it's very well marked and very easy to dial in our adjustment. Once it's set, turn your set screws in, no reason to over tighten them, and your settings are preserved until you want to change them. Dies like this typically need to be used with an arbor press. Some people may choose to use some type of rubber hammer, but for the sake of this video, we're going to stick with the recommended use of this product. Since we've gone over a die, let's take a look at the press. We're going to show how these things can work together and what they can do for us. This is a K&M Arbor Press. It does have the standard force pack option. So if you just want to seat projectiles and you don't want to know how much force you're using, you can buy it without that option. But what fun would that be? The model we have here does have the standard force pack. If you're using very light neck tension, you may want to go with the lower force pack. However, we're going to take a look at the neck tension versus the force that's seen towards the end of the video. So I encourage you to stick around for that. The standard force pack option is going to allow us to measure from zero to 150 pounds of seating force. In addition to the press, and the force pack, you'll also need to buy the indicator which is sold separately. For every one thousandth of travel is equal to one pound of force. The low force pack option, if you're interested in, is a much finer graduation. It measures from anywhere from zero to 50 pounds of seating force. The low force pack also requires a different indicator that reads one pound and half thousandth increments. I don't have one of those to show you, but if you look on their website, I'm sure you can find it. The actual press stroke from top to bottom is one inch. The total working height without the force pack installed is zero to seven and a half inches. But when the force pack is installed, this is reduced from zero to six inches. Height adjustment is relatively easy with the included Allen wrench. Simply loosen these two screws with your Allen wrench allows you to move this up and down on the base to adjust it for the height that is needed. You may wonder what specific advantages this setup is going to give you. The first is inline concentricity. I can't imagine a setup that's going to do a better job of keeping everything in perfect alignment during the seating process. 
I have seen several disciplines of shooting sports start to use these styles of seating dies, so depending on your application, it may be a need. For others, it may just be a nice to have for that extra peace of mind. The second advantage is having the visual feedback of the actual force used to seat the projectile. In reloading, consistency is accuracy. It's hard to have one without the other. A setup like this allows a reloader to see the variation in their process, as well as see when one particular round might be an outlier from the rest of the group. This allows a reloader to segregate that round before it shows up in the wrong spot on your group. The third is the ability to adjust the seating depth at the range. Loading your rounds longer and then fine tuning that adjustment without having to be at your bench can save you time when you're tuning for cartridge overall length. Another advantage, depending on the amount of time between actually doing your reloading as well as getting to fire your rounds, your neck tension can change as your rounds age. By adjusting your cartridge overall length before you're ready to shoot, it allows you to refresh the case necks and possibly improve the standard deviations of your loads when you really want them to perform. This seems to be a very common practice for competitors that do their final seat on their reloads sometimes the night before the competition, just to keep their reloaded rounds fresh. In last week's video, we looked into how neck tension actually affected the performance of our reloads in both group size as well as statistics. Overall, the average velocity seemed to not be greatly affected by neck tension, but the standard deviation and extreme spread certainly seemed to be. One thing that I was not able to do with those reloads was know exactly how consistent the seating force was from round to round. Not knowing that variable during the seating process for that testing, we can't be certain that the variation we saw was from the actual neck tension variable or possibly the variation from round to round not being consistent during our seating process. With this tool, hopefully we will be able to identify the outliers and make our data easier to understand. To understand how this works, nothing would be better than an example, right? So our first example for today, we're going to be using brass that I have previously retired, meaning I don't use it any longer. But it's nice to keep it around for examples. If I was to reload it, I certainly wouldn't expect consistency. But if all the numbers you see today don't graph to a perfectly straight line, don't be very surprised. Again, I consider this brass to be worn out. But it should be good for a visual concept of what's going on and to understand how the setup works. The brass we're using for today's test is Hornady brass, well past its prime, but we did put it through our standard process anyway. It was annealed, full length size with no expanding device, trimmed, chamfered and deburred, and the internal neck dimension was set with our 21st century expander mandrels starting at 261 thousandths and going to 264 and a half thousandths in half thousandth increments. The projectiles we're using are not my favorite either. They're 130 grain Nosler RDFs. For this particular test, to make sure we're getting a good seating distance, we're seating to the cartridge overall length of 2.750. This is only 25 thousandths less than what Nosler recommends for this cartridge overall length. This should give us a very good amount of the projectile in the case and allow us to see those seating force changes. To give you the best representation possible, we're going to run through these one at a time. Starting with the 0.261 mandrel, I'm going to list the lowest force when the projectile starts to move and the final seating force when the projectile was completely seated in the case. As we start off with our 0.261 mandrel, the seating force is going to start around 26 pounds and our final force to actually seat our projectile is going to end up about 76 pounds. Moving on to the 0.2615 expander mandrel, the starting force drops slightly to 22 pounds and our final seating force seemed to drop all the way to 54 pounds. Moving on to the 0.262 mandrel, our starting force was down at 22 pounds again, but our final seating force was 68 pounds. Moving on to 262 and a half, our starting force dropped to 12 pounds, and our final seating force dropped only slightly to 65 pounds. Moving on to the 263 mandrel, our starting force dropped to 6 pounds, our final force ended up at 45 pounds. Moving on to the 263 and a half, our starting force dropped to 5 pounds, our final force being around 57 pounds. Moving on to the 264 mandrel, our starting force was in the ballpark of 8 pounds, and our final seating force was again somewhere very close to 57 pounds. As our neck tension drops to the lowest level we tested today at the 264 and a half, I listed our starting force at zero. As you can see, the projectile already started seating the case just with the weight of the cap but our final seating force to seat our projectile was 15 pounds. Now, if we were to chart this data, I'm not sure exactly how much it's going to tell us, but hopefully it illustrates to what these numbers look like at varying levels of neck tension. Going forward, I will try and correlate these numbers to the actual velocity variation that we see with our reload tests. If you're already using a seating style setup similar to this, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Any tips or tricks you found are always appreciated. 
If you're interested in upcoming testing where we put the actual velocity and statistical data behind these values, make sure you subscribe with notifications turned on. I suggest you check out my playlist on how neck tension actually affects the performance of our reloads. I hope to see you come back next week, and until then, stay safe in small groups.